As for now, guys, let's, let's just go ahead and transition into um, what I believe that Lord has for us today. Um, so if you would, go ahead and just turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Um, you can also use your smart devices if you happen to have the Bible app um, as we begin this morning. We're currently um, making our way through the book of Colossians. We've been in this series as we've been going through this whole book. And again, just to recap, the overall theme and message um, of Colossians is Christ is supreme, the, the fullness of who God is in Christ. And the purpose of that theme is not just to talk about it and have our head in the clouds about theological and Christological truths. It's to help the recipients of this letter to become a more spiritually robust, a more spiritually mature people in Christ. And what I love about this is that we get in on that too, right? We have the opportunity today, and as we've been doing for months, going through this letter in this book and learning from it in the same exact way. So again, just a little bit of recap. We've been in this for a while, so we can't belabor it. But in the first chapter, we discovered the true meaning of the gospel. We talked about what is the gospel and what does it do, not just upon receiving it, but upon continuing it. We also talked about the magnitude of who Christ is, the the cosmic nature of of who who Jesus is. We talked about the fullness of the cross and understanding it correctly and biblically. We talked about what Christian suffering points towards. And then two weeks ago, we began the second chapter of Colossians, and we discovered much regarding how Christ looks to strengthen us and where that strength is hidden. So today we're going to continue where we left off a couple weeks ago in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. So um, feel free to follow along with me as I read it aloud. If you don't have a Bible or anything with you, just follow along with uh, me on the screen. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, this is a short passage, but uh, Douglas Moo, a a modern commentator and theologian, rightly calls these two verses the heart of Colossians. And the reason for this is because these two short verses sum up the entire message written to the Colossian people. They also serve as a summary of all that is left to come in the rest of this book. We see Paul reflect on this awesome theology of who Christ is, and we went through that in chapter one. Who is Christ? Who have you received? What does that mean for your life? And now in chapter two, he begins to go into the practical teaching. What does that mean for your life? How does this begin to change the natural results of the way you live? So we, we've spent a lot of weeks unpacking the long introduction of Colossians 1. And now in chapter 2, we, treat the, we see the true emphasis of this message coming to the surface. And that is this, that this Christ, who is God's mystery, who is God's wisdom, who is God's image, Jesus, is the one whom you have received in fullness in becoming Christians. Moreover, this Christ is none other than the crucified and risen Jesus, now exalted as Lord. And this word Lord that Paul uses in this passage is really important for us to take note of because Paul uses this title for Jesus more than any other in all of his letters. It shows up some 230 times in his different epistles and writings. And the the word Lord is important because it carries with it a certain distinction. It carries with it this distinction of superiority, mastery, and the right to command Um, This phrase, Jesus is Lord, is also found all throughout the New Testament, and it was one of the earliest confessions within the church. It was used in baptism. Um, When people would be baptized, that was their their confession. Jesus is, in this word, Lord. Um, So the acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord implies something. It implies an obligation to follow him, honor him, and obey him. So it's very unsurprising then that we start seeing Lord show up more and more as Colossians progresses. We don't see it as much in chapter one, but in chapter two and onward, Lord shows up more and more because there are an increasing number of commands that are given. 
So Paul wants us to see something. If we're going to fully ingest this passage, if we're going to fully make sense of what Paul is trying to say to these people and, and by extension to us, it starts with understanding what it means to see Jesus as Lord. To see him as Lord then means that Jesus determines the path of those who choose to follow him. While it's scriptural for us to say that we are friends of God, that friendship, however, does not make us peers. Guys, I was recently shocked um, when my two-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, she told me something, um, you know, she said something and then followed it with, do it right now, daddy. And uh, I began to just talk with her and say, you know, Mackenzie, there are times where daddy needs to tell you, you need to do something right now, but you actually don't share that same privilege and ability that your daddy does, okay? Um, so now I'm regularly trying not to laugh when I hear statements like, Daddy, I said no. I'm like, oh, Mackenzie, no, you don't get to say that to me. So we, we're, we're working through that right now. She's two and a half, so it's just teaching moment after teaching moment right now. And, uh, you know, I love to play with Mackenzie. I love to be, you know, just silly with her and laugh with her. But there are times that she has to realize that I'm not just her peer. I'm her father. Um, and because of that, there is an interactive complexity to our relationship. In other words, I try to relate to my daughters, mainly Mackenzie in this season, in different ways in order to have the best possible relationship I can with her. So, you know, for example, if all of my dealings with my kids in the long run were authoritative, then you can kind of fill in the blanks for how that relationship long term would go. It would be one of fear. It would be one of, you know, not having a very personal relationship. However, on the flip side of that, if all of my dealings with my kids consisted of me trying to be their friend, then they would not become the girls that I know God designed them and has called them to be. The same exact principle rings true in our relationship with God. You see, we can be guilty. And again, I think we all can admit to this, of becoming so casual in our view of God, that we actually lose sense of our placement before him. You see, while Jesus is gentle enough to be the Lamb of God, he's also mighty enough to be the Lion of Judah. And while we know that Jesus calls us friend, we also call him king. So there are things that God can say to us because he's God that we have no business repeating back to him as his citizens of his kingdom. This means that there are choices that we have to surrender to Jesus as Lord. It means that we allow him to tell us, this is what your life is going to look like. And the reason that scares us often is because we don't fully know his heart. Because when we fully know his heart, that doesn't scare us like it should, uh, like it would if, if, we, if we didn't. It also means that um, we have to keep in mind our flesh. Because our flesh would very much like to remind us and tell us that Jesus is solely, only your friend. And this is probably because it, the, the word friend in our minds paints a picture of someone we can spend time with when we, don't, when we want to. Um, but we also can have our space when we don't. It paints a picture of someone we can get together with, enjoy, but do it on our timetable to do it when we feel comfortable with it and in a way that keeps us in control of our day-to-day -day lives. Paul, however, wanted the Colossians to see Jesus for who he is chiefly. And chiefly, Jesus is Lord. So Jesus being Lord reminds us that he's to be submitted to. He's, he's to be obeyed and followed no matter how we feel about those things that are being given to us, commands, instructions, and, and, and where he's leading us. So it's that understanding of Christ that really begins to change our outlook and our understanding of what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to do life with God day in, day out? He's Lord. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just stop there. It's not simply enough to say and believe that Jesus is Lord. Those who receive Christ must also, in Paul's words, continue in Christ. I want to reread this. This is Colossians 2, 6, 6 in the first part of 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, he doesn't stop there, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. I want you to notice something here. 
what the Colossians previously received is what they're now called to presently live in. Think about that for a minute. We live in a culture where we get, 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 get all the time. And we often think our spiritual lives should be the same. We get something, we're like, okay, God, what's next? Give me something else. He says, no, I want you to go back to what I gave you, and I want you to continue in that. I want you to stop looking for something new, and I want you to go back to your roots, and I want you to begin to flesh out that very first thing that I told you and gave to you in the gospel. So what they have is what they're being urged to endure in. This word follow, he says, when you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. This phrase, follow him, um, that Paul is using is literally translated walk in him. Okay, which in Jewish thought, this word for walk was and is the standard term for ethical conduct of how we conduct ourselves in our day-to-day lives. So here by using this term, we find the emphasis of what Paul is saying is the kind of conduct that is appropriate for people who are calling themselves followers of Jesus. We also see Paul use another really important word here. He says, continue, continue. And with this word, Paul introduces a new idea that the fullness of Christ cannot and should not be received and then put aside, but instead it should be lived in every single day. And that right there, guys, seems to be Paul's greatest concern for this church, that what started in them will not stop in them. Their reception of the gospel marked the beginning of their Christian lives, but that's not all that it offers. And we make the mistake, too, of thinking that's all that it offers. It's that very gospel that will also lead them into growth, that will lead them into becoming more mature in the Christian life. So we see this, and we see Paul tell the people that he wants them to continue in Christ, but he doesn't again stop there. He says, and this is how you do that. He says, you receive Jesus as Lord, but you must continue to follow him. And then he says something else. He says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. So how do you continue in this? How do you continue in Christ? How do you continue to follow him? You do it by letting your roots grow down into him and letting your lives be built on him. So I'll tell you this, you know, having kids has drastically changed I'm sorry, guys. All of my illustrations right now are just about my kids. That's, I feel like that's my life is working kids and working kids. And, you know, my, my wife and I got some time this week to go out. It was the first time in a long time. We, we had like an hour and a half to ourselves. And it was like, thank you, Jesus. Like, this is, this is good to just have some time together. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, for me and Steph, we really like action shows. We like suspense. We like these kinds of things. And, you know, throughout our marriage, that's kind of been our go-to stuff is what we watch. But recently, we found different kinds of shows on in our house. Shows like Dora the Explorer and Daniel Tiger and Winnie the Pooh um, that are playing instead. And, you know, the thing is, it's not all bad because, you know, I remember watching the same Winnie the Pooh cartoon when I was a kid that Mackenzie's currently into right now. And the most interesting part of the whole thing is the fact that Um, there's a huge difference in how I see that cartoon as an adult versus how I saw it when I was watching it as a kid. So for instance, if you watch Winnie the Pooh, you know, you you guys are like, yeah, I want to watch Winnie the Pooh. If you watch Winnie the Pooh for any length of time, you'll find that each character in it has some sort of personal hangup, some sort of something going on in their lives. For instance, Pooh is super naive, right? He's constantly getting into all of these messes and things and situations he has to be rescued from. Tigger's pretty selfish, not really worried about anyone else. He's just bouncing and knocking people over. Then you have Eeyore, who's incredibly negative, incredibly negative, depressed even. And then you have Rabbit, who's judging everyone. And Pooh, get out of here. We don't want you here. Piglet is afraid of everything. And you go on and on and on. And there's actually one episode where the characters become aware. They become self-aware and they're like, man, this is a problem. Piglet's like, why am I so afraid all the time? And and they, they start dealing with these things and trying to, but by the end of the episode, they realize and accept, you know, these, these things are just a part of who we are and we're just gonna live with them and move on. Now, I, I get it. You guys are impressed. You guys are like, is it really Mackenzie watching Winnie the Pooh or are you watching it? Because you're, you have a lot of information here about Winnie the Pooh. Um, guys, here's the thing. When we accept the areas of lack 
and immaturity and slavery that we have in our lives, then we're actively choosing to root ourselves in the things that we have no business rooting ourselves in. We begin to say statements, maybe you've heard yourself say something like, oh, that's just how I am. You know, or that, oh, even a family member, oh, that's just how they are. Regarding sin, regarding struggles, bondage that's presently in our lives that ought not be there if we are followers of Jesus. And the sad part is that it doesn't have to just be you personally who's saying these things or believing these things in order to fall into the trap in your mind. Maybe other people in your life have played a role in reinforcing that you should just accept certain things about yourself as normal that are in fact not of God. Um, this, this thing that, that Christ does for us, this thing that Paul is talking for, about for us, is that he longs for us to continue in him so that we can root ourselves deeply and begin to find freedom from some of those shackles that we've labeled as normal. Oh, dad, dad's just angry. That's just how he is. Mom, mom's just controlling. Maybe you've heard that. Oh, you're just controlling. You're just angry. You, you never change. You've been that way since you were a kid. Then we accept to live with the very things that Christ died to free us from. We lower the standard then of what it means to continue in Christ, and therefore we find very little fulfillment in our walks with Jesus. And it feels more like something we have to do. Oh, I have to spend time with Jesus. He, 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 he wants to make me spend time with him. We find a lack of fulfillment. And on top of that, we find a lack of sustaining power in our lives because we've made duty out of the things that we should be doing out of freedom and desire, the kind of fulfillment and power that would be in our lives if we were to continue in the gospel. So my question is this, why do we put ourselves in this place? Why do we find ourselves settling for less than what God has provided for us? And guys, I believe the answer lies directly in what our lives are presently rooted in. What our lives are presently rooted in. No matter how large a tree grows, that root system beneath it ultimately is what is going to determine its future and its health, right? So when our lives are rooted in anything other than Christ, and you have to understand we are speaking metaphorically here. We're going to talk about that in a minute. You know, Paul uses these metaphors to help us understand spiritual truths. But when we root our lives in anything other than Jesus, there's two things that naturally begin to happen. The first is spiritual stagnation. If you are rooting your day-to-day -day life in something other than Jesus, you will find over time that you are spiritually stagnated, that you are feeling dry. You can't remember the last time you felt alive in Christ, but that's not all. You will also find yourself emotionally unfulfilled. So we turn to stuff. I need to get some more stuff. We turn to jobs. I need to get that promotion. We turn to relationships. I need to get that person. I need to get deeper. We turn to something else to fight these things. We're spiritually dry. We're emotionally withdrawn. We're not feeling fulfilled, so we try to fill it. So here's some cues. I want to give you some cues. If you can say these things about your life with God, then you can begin to confidently say, okay, my life probably isn't rooted presently where it ought to be rooted. For instance, when our schedule is too busy for God, when we prioritize the things that are temporal over what is eternal on a daily basis, when our deepest sense of direction, when our deepest sense of how we feel in day-to-day -day life is being determined by other people, or it's being determined by our circumstances rather than our daily connection to Jesus. If these descriptions are, are things that are true about your life, then, then we can know with confidence that the foundation that we're presently rooted in is something other than Christ. And we have been duped by the enemy. We have been deceived by the enemy of our souls into believing that it's enough to just start the race. And again, I will lovingly say that there are a lot of people, a lot of churches, a lot of pastors. That's the focus. Just start the race. Just come to know Jesus. Just say he's Lord. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, the Christ that you have received, may you continue to follow him so that your roots will go down into him deeply and your lives will be built upon him. So then we mistakenly believe that we've done our part. I received Jesus. I'm a Christian. 
we've done our part and we can move on and we can just go back to life as normal. And guys, so many end up in the long haul relying on the spirituality of others to get them through life. And in, the, in, in light of that, they're waiting for Jesus to finish the race that he has set out for them to do as his people. And again, lovingly, I will say that I, I think many believers would find it hard to honestly say that what they have with God is a daily interactive connection with him. And I want you to ask yourself that. If, if I were to ask you, describe your relationship with Jesus. Are the first things that come to mind a sense of duty? Or is it a sense of loving connection and intimacy? If you were to ask me about my relationship with my wife, first thing that we would both say is, you know what, it's not perfect. But you know what, it's not marked chiefly by duty because we love each other. Are there duties that happen in a marriage? Absolutely. Are there commitments that happen? Yes. Do we have a commitment to Jesus? Do we have a duty to him? Yes. But above all of that is a loving, intimate relationship. Paul reveals that there's a completely different mindset for how we ought to be thinking about Jesus, for how we ought to be approaching this Christian life. I want to read this to you. It's 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says this. This is towards the end of his life. He's old. He's done a lot of ministry. He's planted a lot of churches. He's seen it all. And he says this, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. And I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. The prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. I want you to notice at the end of Paul's life, what he confidently says. He says, I have finished the race. I have finished the race. He had fought the good fight. He had remained faithful. He had continued in Christ for all of his days. In other words, there was effort. There was an active effort on his part. It was Paul who ran the race, but it was who who gave the reward? It was Christ. So what is this reward that Christ is giving for the race? The reward is not that Christ will run the race for you, but that you will receive the fullness of Christ upon completing the race. So that the gift, the crown that we're receiving, it's Christ himself in all of his fullness, in all of his glory, in all of his love. So therefore, guys, we can see that reducing the Christian life to statements like, all you have to do is believe. Those kinds of statements can actually be very misleading. They can actually be very harmful to our understanding of what it means to follow or continue in Christ. So what, what, let's talk about this for a minute. What is true? is that we are saved by grace through faith alone, okay? So in other words, you are not saved by what you do. You are not saved by your performance. You're not saved by what you can produce. You are not the reason you are saved. You are saved because Christ chose to save us, right? Christ did the work there. But again, if we believe that the Christian life consists only of receiving, Receiving Jesus as Lord in our hearts. Receiving forgiveness as we repent of our sin. Receiving a new home when Jesus returns at his second coming. And then we stop and say, that's the Christian life. And we go on with business as usual. And guys, we find that we've actually missed a central key component of what it means to be a Christian. That, what I've just described, is not the full gospel. That is not the life that Christ has called his disciples to. But the gospel is not only about receiving, it's also about responding. About responding in obedience. Responding in discipline. Responding in action. So in other words, we're responding to that which has been received. And when we just receive and we fail to respond, we find that we started the race, but we've never really continued in it. Now, the false gospel that I'm describing right now, unfortunately, is the reason why so many Christians today are not far off spiritually from where they were the first day that they started following Jesus. 
And guys, it's not because they don't love God. It's not because of the fact that they want to live spiritually stunted. It's not the fact that they want to be spiritually immature. It's not the fact that they don't want to grow. It's often because they have started something in receiving the gospel, but they have not continued in the race of being rooted in the proper source, which is Christ and Christ alone. So while salvation is initially received, without any work of our own making it happen, for that salvation to fully transform our lives the way it's supposed to here and now, it's going to take effort. It's going to take some work on our part. We cannot accept to be rooted in things that we ought not be rooted rooted in. We must be rooted in Christ and build our lives on him. We can't receive the gospel and then set it aside. We have to continue in Christ so that we can become mature people. There's a race that has to be run. There's a prize that that Jesus is offering to us and it's himself in all of his fullness. So again, guys, the kind of existence that you live is chiefly determined by your understanding of this sequential life. Are we just receiving and then we're good? Or is there a duality? Is there an exchange of relationship? Is there a call to actually respond to these things, not just once and for all in our hearts, but daily in our physical bodies and the things that we do and the time that we have and the way that we lead our lives. So Paul finishes the whole passage in this way. After telling them, think your roots down deep into Christ and build your lives on him. The second part of Colossians 2, 7, Paul says, then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You know, one thing, I'm not going to mention names, guys, but several, going back several years, there was a very well-known worship leader um, who had been leading worship for thousands and thousands of people for a long time. And all of a sudden it came out, I'm an atheist. And the Twitter world and Facebook world, every, the church, everyone was losing their minds because I, like, wait, 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 wait a minute. How are you an atheist? You have been leading people into the presence of God for, what, 10 years? And and now you don't believe it. And guys, it's not our job to cast judgment. It's not our job to figure these things out. But let me tell you this. We can go through the motions very, very well for a very long time. But if we do not continue, then what Paul just said isn't going to happen. Because what does he say? He says, after you do all of this, after you root yourself deeply into Christ and build your life on him, he says, then your faith will grow strong. Then your faith will grow strong. So if we are rooting our lives, if we're building it on something else, we can have everything looking great, but there's not much strength there in our faith because it's just the start of the race. The other thing I find so interesting is that, you know, Paul loves his metaphors. I mentioned it earlier. So apparently we're supposed to walk in Christ while being rooted like a tree solidly built like a house and overflowing like a jug of wine. It's like, whoa, stick to one thought, Paul. What are, what are you doing here? Um, and it may seem like overkill, all of these different metaphors, but guys, each of them presented means something. It's something important for us to grasp and hold on to. So we've discussed what does it mean to walk in Christ? It means that we conduct ourselves worthy of the Lord that we're following. What does it mean to be rooted in Christ? It means that we are building our, are rooting ourselves deeply into him, not into the culture, not into distractions, not into anything else. And we do that with our time. How are we building? What is it that you're investing in? Where moth and rust destroy? Or are we investing in the eternal kingdom of God? So then lastly, overflowing. Overflowing. The last part of this verse, the last line says, and then you will overflow with thankfulness. And this is so important, guys. Uh, we, we've talked about all this, but after you do all of that, after you do all of these different things, then you'll overflow with thankfulness. And guys, thankfulness should fill the church so that it constantly is spilling over. And it's, it's only going to happen, though, from us taking our role in discipleship very seriously. Because let me just tell you, nothing really good happens in your life until gratefulness and thankfulness begin to happen. Because when we begin to be grateful and thankful, we see things differently. 
We don't take for granted the things that we often do. As we've already seen in this letter, gratitude to God should be the main characteristic of the people of God. So the church that learns how to truly worship God is a church that's truly going to grow in maturity because a, a grateful church is a worshiping church, right? So this final phrase regarding thankfulness, it's not an afterthought. It's not just, oh, and then you'll be thankful. This is so important. Um, I'll tell you this story. Growing up as a kid, I was always drawn to music. I love music. Um, I started, you know, very young playing piano and bass. And when I was about 16, I started teaching myself guitar. Um, so I was 16 and uh, just started dating, who is now my wife, Steph, um, in high school. And she got me like the best gift ever. She took me to see John Mayer in concert. And if you're unfamiliar with who John Mayer is, he is a virtuoso guitarist. Um, and he's one of the most revered guitar players that's currently alive today. Um, just unbelievably talented. Just like, you know, you're born with that. You did not just work for that. You were born with that. So I left that concert with my jaw on the floor. And I was like, I just started guitar. And I'm watching this guy just wail and just do all of these crazy things. And I just, I looked at Steph and I said, Steph, I'm just going to go burn my guitar. I said, I'm just going to throw it away. Because I'm telling you what, I'm never going to be as good as John Mayer. And the thing is, guys, I didn't do that. I didn't give up guitar. I kept at it. And 12 years later, I can tell you confidently that I am light years ahead of where I was 12 years ago. There's, there's rarely a time where I, can, I can't figure out how to play something if I really set my mind to it. And am I as good as John Mayer? No. Let me tell you that confidently. And I never, ever will be. But let me tell you this. Comparison destroys thankfulness. Comparison destroys thankfulness. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you just, you don't have a clue how to take the next steps towards continuing in Christ. Maybe you're like, okay, I get what you're saying. How do I do that? Maybe you don't know the specifics of how to deeper root yourself into him. Maybe you're, you're distracted and you've been rooting yourselves in other things. Guys, don't do what I did. Don't look at the people around you and compare yourself to them. I don't know my Bible like they do. I can't, I can't pray like that person. You know, I, I'll never be as close to God, obviously, as, as him or her. You see, rather than comparing yourself to others, why don't, why don't we just begin to thank God for who he has been and who he always will be to you? Start continuing today, knowing that where you are today is not going to be where you are next year if you don't give in to hopelessness. You know why so many people I found over the years don't really just get into their Bible and make it a normal routine in their lives of just being with the Lord in Scripture? It's because of shame. It's because people say, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't know it. I don't know anything about it. And I, I, I just, I don't know it. So it, they allow shame and they allow comparison and these other things to keep them from being with God. Let me just tell you, don't compare yourself to anyone else. God is not comparing you to someone else. And if God's not doing it, neither should you. Instead, you can gratefully embrace where you are with God and what he's been to you so far, knowing that he's going to continue to grow you into maturity as you deeply root yourself in him, and he's going to spur you on to greater things in your life with him. We have to allow thankfulness to fill our lives and focus not on what we are lacking, but instead on what Christ has in his abundance that's available to you today. You guys, will just be honest. The way that I grew as a musician was not by saying, oh, man. I'll never be as good as John. I will never play like him. The, re the way that I grew was by continuing in the little bit that I knew. I taught myself guitar. I didn't know much, but I learned an E chord. And then I did research on YouTube and I learned some other chords and I kept playing those chords. And then I started getting more confident and then I led to a few more chords. And then I began to learn new things. And over a decade of that, there's, there's been a lot of growth. And instead of sitting there and comparing and doing all of these things in the same way, your growth as a disciple will come not from wishing, not from waiting, not from beating yourself up. Your growth will come from choosing to live rooted in different things than you've been rooted in up to this point in your life. You growing as a disciple will come from continuing in what you do know so that God can lead you into what you don't know. It will come from searching out the small connection that you might feel with God 
and what you have now and allowing him the space and the time and the effort to build upon that. Don't give in to hopelessness. Don't say, man, I just got to get through life. Jesus says, I came to give you life and to give it abundantly. Don't settle when Jesus is saying, continue, continue. There's a false teaching in Colossians and these people are, this is why Paul's writing them in the first place. This false teaching looked to urge the Colossians to seek new experiences, to find new ways of access to the deeper things of God. And we've talked about that a lot. Paul looks instead to reveal that the key to depth is not about seeking something new. Finding depth in Christ isn't about seeking something new. Instead, it comes from focusing on what you have already had and trusted all along. This immediately seems less exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, I want something new. I want something from God. I need a word. I need this. I need something. I need a message. I need a sign. I need Jesus saying, listen, those things come and they go. But when you focus down on who I simply want to be in your life, that is a place of lasting fruit. There's nothing new to consume in this scenario. There's nothing innovative that's being offered in our experience. It goes against everything in our culture. But if the fullness of God is found in Christ and in Christ alone, then that means that we don't have to look anywhere else. We can stop searching. So guys, we don't have to accept the old things that we've rooted ourselves in. We don't have to become complacent spiritually stagnated after receiving the gospel, but instead can continue in Christ as he helps develop us and grow us into spiritual maturity. We don't have to live by comparing ourselves to others, but can instead realize that God has given us the freedom to be ourselves. Where we are today is not where we will be later. And just being there with God, allowing him to work in you is going to be the the key. In closing, guys, we're to remember what we received. And what we've received is Christ. We're to be rooted and built in him. And that will begin to confirm our faith and build our faith strong. And all of that will lead to an abundance of thanksgiving. Our lives will begin to take different shape. So I want you to just bow with me right now as you, you take a minute and just ask the Lord, okay, God, where am I today? We're talking about being rooted in Christ. Rooted in him, continuing in him. And rather than sharing a bunch of different things, I just, I really felt like I was just supposed to ask you some questions. These are just just questions, just for you to ask yourself. Are you continuing in Christ? Are you continuing in him? Can you honestly just say, right in my life, I have been continuing in him. Have you received Christ and just stopped right there? Or are you responding to Christ as you actively live a life of communion, intimacy, and interaction with the one who saved you? Another question, what is your life currently rooted in? What is your life currently being built upon? What is the thing that if you removed it, everything else would begin to fall apart? Is that thing Jesus? Or are you being rooted in distractions that surround your day to day? Are you finding your fulfillment and worth from Christ and Christ alone, or is something else supplementing it? Last questions for you. Are you comparing yourself to others, or are you pressing into Jesus? Is your focus on, oh, I'll never be this, I'll never be able to do that, or are you saying, Jesus, thank you for where I am versus where I was the day I met you? And Lord, I don't want to settle for where I am today. I want to continue to grow and become more like you. Are you hopeless? about growing because you're comparing yourself? Are you free to be who you are in your own journey with Christ? No matter what the answers are to these questions for you in your life today, let me just tell you that his mercies are new every morning. Every morning. So there's no room for shame today. There's no room for condemnation. What there is room for is saying, okay, Lord, I repent. I repent for rooting myself in this. I I repent for not continuing in who you are. I repent for comparing myself to others and Lord set me on a new path where my roots are growing into you, where I'm building my life on you and things will begin to look different. So Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters. 
And Lord, this week as I was preparing, I just felt a burden. Lord, that, that they not give in to hopelessness. They not give in to apathy about continuing. Not giving in to apathy about pressing in and pressing on. That the race is not just called to be started, but to be finished. And Lord, I pray for an infusion of strength an infusion of perspective, an infusion of life so that they can leave this place empowered to press into you. Not just get through life, not just build their lives on other things and and have fun things they look forward to and that's what's fueling them. Lord, may every day we find our strength in you, Jesus. So Lord, we, we love you, we need you and I pray that there would be a rooting that would take place this week as we do life with you and as we trust you to be for us all that you want to be. And we ask it in your risen name as Lord. Amen.